Good morning, everybody. Uh, I uh, would first like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land on which we meet today. Uh, and on behalf of the Sustainable Minerals Institute and University of Queensland, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Welcome, I'm Associate Professor Marcin Ziemski uh, from the Sustainable Minerals Institute at the University of Queensland. And I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Introduction to Simine Mine Simulation, delivered by Anthony Mello and Harry Cinco from Verma Collaborations, who I hope you already see. The team at Verma have an extensive um, range of skills, practical capabilities and experience ideally suited to the uh, challenges of creating, designing, developing, implementing, and maintaining the latest technology solutions in the mining industry. And Anthony and Harry will be walking us through Simine, an integrated mine simulation, uh, an integrated mine value chain simulation, which they developed and offers a true to life experience of the challenges of improving an integrated resources value chain. As ever, you can submit questions at any time during the presentation via the Q&A button and I invite you to do so. And I will put the questions to Anthony and Harry at the end of the presentation. Anthony and Harry, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcin, and hello to everyone who is joining us on today's session. And thank you for taking the time to, to spend with us and run through this presentation with us. My name is Anthony Miller. I will be delivering most of the presentation, but on the call with me is my colleague, Harry Sinko, who's also on, online and, and, and will jump in whenever necessary to assist me throughout this presentation. So as Marcin has highlighted, uh, the purpose of today's presentation is to introduce you to Simine, which is an integrated mining value chain simulation, which has been used across multiple industries, geographic locations, and with the main purpose of helping organizations maximize their system performance, whatever the system may be. So we hope out of today's session, you'll walk away with a better understanding of some of the key elements of our proven systems thinking methodology and how the SimMind experience may potentially help you and your organization develop the necessary skills and capability to achieve your strategic goal. Now, as Marcin mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A chat. We will share our details as well at the end of the presentation, so you can get hold of us after the presentation as well. And I'll try and get to the questions and answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, before I go further, Harry, anything you wanted to say before we go ahead? No, it's really great to have the opportunity to talk to all of you people and uh, your, all the listeners out there and also that, uh, yeah, any questions, we'll deal with them at the end. Thank you. Away you go, and Perfect. Thanks, Harry. Now, before we get into the actual mine simulation, I thought, well, we thought it would be uh, pertinent to just take you through what we see as the challenge that the simulation is trying to solve as we see it based on our interactions with previous clients and some of the research we've been doing around the challenges that many organizations, particularly in the mining sector where we've done a bulk of our work, face in, in the age of uh, the 4IR, as people call it, or the fourth industrial revolution, as the, as the term has been coined. So what is the challenge that the mine is, is trying to solve with our offering? So the challenge that most organizations face, as we found, is that most organizations are performing well below what their system capability is able to uh, actually produce in terms of the potential performance of the installed capacity of the actual system. So this is because of a various number of reasons that we'll run through some of them through today's presentation. And what we have found with our clients previously when we do some data analysis on some of the production output numbers, is these figures can be as low as 30 to 40% of what the actual installed capacity of the system is. So you can see that there is a huge potential to actually move organizations up that S-curve in order to help them 
achieve the maximum out of their current installed capacity without even spending further on capital. Now, traditionally, as organizations are underperforming and the assets are underperforming, the traditional approaches that organizations usually take. One of these is the traditional cost cutting uh, approach, which obviously the organization is there for the sole purpose of, according to some people, the sole purpose of returning value to the shareholders. We have a different view on that, but it is a reality that we live in that shareholder value and shareholder return is probably what drives most businesses. And in order to increase shareholder return, we try to cut the costs so that we maximize the returns so that we keep the shareholders happy and they keep investing in, in the business. So one of the ways we see traditionally organizations approach this is that they try to go on a cost cutting initiative, increase the return so that they can actually <clears throat> keep the shareholders happy. But what we have seen is this potentially has other detrimental effects that at the time these cost cutting initiatives are implemented are not as obvious to the people that are implementing. The other approach is to say, well, we've cut costs. Now the people that are there need to work harder, right? Harder and smarter as people say. And we expect the people who are already probably constrained and limited in their ability to, to actually deliver, to deliver more and squeeze more uh, out of the, the, the actual system because we expect people to work harder and work more efficiently, as people say, to get more out of the system. Now that may work in a short period of time, but it's not a sustainable solution to actually fixing the problem that you are underperforming as per your system performance curve. And the third approach that we generally see is what is actually a approach that's been there through our time, but with the advent of technology and what has been coined industry 4.0, as I mentioned earlier, is now this investment in technology. Right? This has been a phenomena that has existed through our time, but with the number of technologies that are coming out, it has become more prominent and a more prevalent thing that organizations are resorting to as a silver bullet towards solving all their issues. So basically all these solutions are trying to achieve higher efficiencies, higher quality, and a reduction of cost. And you'll find that most organizations are either embarking on one, all, or some combination of the three in order to try and improve the actual operational performance. So I'm gonna focus on the last one, which I mentioned, which is the digital uh, transformation or industry 4.0, which has become the new uh, buzzword around, which has been seen as the sort of silver bullet, as I mentioned, that's gonna help achieve all those three outcomes, increase your efficiency, reduce your cost, and increase your quality of your product all at the same time for a little bit of investment. But what we are seeing is that a lot of organizations are being overloaded with a number of different technologies. They are trying to find solutions to problems that probably don't exist within the, uh, or are not the right problems to be solving within their system. And they're investing a lot of money in these technologies that aren't really helping them move up that S curve and realize the full potential of their current system. In essence, what they're doing is they're actually creating a new S curve, which is moving up the actual potential um, <clears throat> maximum productivity out of this uh, performance out of the system and not really harnessing the full value out of the current uh, installed capacity of an organization. So as you can see there, some of the different technologies are in different stages of the hype curve. I think some of you know the hype curve. If you think of something like the cloud, which has gone through all the stages, and I think we're finally getting to understand how we can harness the cloud to better enable us to uh, <clears throat> collaborate better in order to share information easier and enable us to communicate real time with people across uh, the, 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 the globe. That is one of the technologies that has gone through the whole hype curve where it was super hyped up. It went through the trough of disillusionment for those who know the hype curve. And now people are starting to actually realize the value. But there are many other industries that are, or technologies that are still on that big hype curve and are promising to deliver this big uh, improvement for organizations. But that may not be realized if 
the technology is not implemented in a proper way or not implemented in the right places to solve the actual problems that the organization has. So we need a different approach in order to realize the full return on investment on any of these technologies that we're gonna be investing in. So what we have seen through the work that we do, this plethora of technology and the fact that people are just throwing this technology in, this pressures to perform uh, in, in the markets. Markets, as well, everyone knows, especially commodities go up and down, especially when they're down, there's a lot of pressure to perform. And what this results in, uh, we can summarize in these seven points, which is one disappointing of customers, customers being the people who actually the markets who expect higher outputs from the, the actual mining houses and they're not getting those outputs because investing in the capital, but we're not seeing the end product out of it. And the other customer to consider is the actual shareholder who's investing all this money and expecting a return for it, but they're not seeing the actual return on the money that they're investing. Then there's a lack of focus when there we mean actually a lack of prioritization. So there's a lot of solutions chasing problems rather than uh, uh, <clears throat> the actual problems driving which solutions should be implemented. So because the technology is out there, we believe that if we just take it in, put it in, it will solve all our problems. And that has driven this initiative overload, which is item number three. So there's all these initiatives that everyone believes is going to drive improvement up the S-curve and <clears throat> actually help the organization move forward. And this means that there's this need for continual capital expenditure. Right? So every time as a new technology, as everyone who has bought software would know, they sell you the one module, but they don't tell you it comes with the five other modules that you need to buy to actually make it work. So there's this need for this continual capital expenditure to keep this, 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 this going, and it's not actually a sustainable model. And what this results in, which is point five, is actually a complexity in your value stream. So you end up with <coughs> this plethora now of data that's coming at you that people don't know what to do with. Now there's these uh, uh, different machinery and different technologies that are now having to be trans uh, integrated into the actual way we do operations and the way we do day-to-day -day our work routines and our management routines. And this brings an additional complexity into our value streams, which is not clearly understood. And people don't understand how to actually decipher that and make effective decisions out of that. And all of that basically leads to a lot of frustration and negative conflict, that's what we're finding. Uh, people are just frustrated, they've now been overloaded. There's this complexity that they can't deal with. And that ultimately leads to low employee morale and motivation. And this is what we're finding when we're engaging with the clients. And this is across the globe. Now, to further emphasize on that point, we've, through our research, sort of summarized those into four main areas that frustrate most of the people that we engage with. Now, we're talking about people on the actual workshop floor, the people on the ground floor, the people actually on the shop floor who are doing the actual work. So we had taken an approach of actually going down, down to those people, understanding what their frustrations are and where the actual issues are so that we can start building it and building, so finding solutions to actual problems that exist within the system. One of the biggest concerns that we find or frustrations that people deal with is that performance targets are not effectively communicated with them. People come to work every day, they work, but they do not know what a good day looks like for them. So there's this, take an example of a mine, there's this ounces target every day, but for the person on the face, on the, on the, on the <coughs> who's operating the drill rig, what does that mean for him, right? If you tell him the number of ounces that needs to be produced today, that means nothing to him. How do we relate it to a metric, a measure that actually speaks to the work that he does on a day-to-day -day basis so that he knows whether he's performing well or he's not? Second point that we find generally is people say they're not adequately equipped with the tools to succeed. So we believe as people who are in positions to implement these technologies that by implementing these technologies, everyone's life should be made easier. But going back to the point that we haven't, if we haven't properly identified what the problems are and we just throw solutions at it, we may be throwing the wrong solutions at it, which only help to frustrate, further frustrate people and not actually equip, equip them with the right tools to help them make the effective decisions 
and help them succeed in their jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. So we need to make sure that we're equipping people with the right tools to enable them to succeed. The third thing that we find is that people say they are randomly moved from pillar to post, meaning there's a lot of initiatives coming in today existing, management changes, new management comes with a new thing, they need to drop what they were doing, do something else, and they always be moved from pillar to post, asked to do many different things that some of them are not even within the scope of the work that they initially had been assigned to do. So that's one of the biggest frustrations people find is that once they're really getting into something, they're really getting good at it. Someone new comes with a new idea, disrupts the whole, the whole system, and then now they have to start all over from scratch. The fourth thing that we find is that people find that nobody speaks to them to find out what their opinion is. And this is actually counterproductive because we need to be speaking to the people on the shop floor to understand what they are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis so that we can base our decisions on the actual problems that will help drive the organization forward based on what people are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. So biggest frustration with people is that their opinion doesn't matter. People know stuff, I know things, I work with these things on a daily basis, and there's some solutions that I can contribute that can actually help us grow and drive forward. So this is what we generally find when we go into organizations and, and speak to, to some of our clients. And it just, it just speaks to the frustrations that come out of this digital age and the fact that we're just throwing solutions at things without trying to understand what the actual problems are. So the conclusion that we've come to is that the traditional approaches that we usually take, the three that I mentioned earlier alone, will not unlock real value. Right? So we need a different approach. And that is what we will, I will talk through through the rest of this presentation. I will take you through what that approach looks like and what we, we perceive a holistic approach towards this conundrum that we find ourselves in. So before I go into that, just to give you guys a perspective of where most organizations are thinking, what, what most organizations are thinking about currently. So this is a recent McKinsey Global Survey, actually just released this month. It is all about reskilling. So they do this global reskilling survey on an annual basis. This year, they got over 700 respondents, uh, responses from different organizations across the globe. So what they found is 68% of organizations are actually saying that they are looking at doing more skills building than they did before COVID-19. So there's an increase in, in the number of, of, of organizations that are looking to do skills building of that existing teams before COVID-19. And this is generally driven by the second step, which is 58% of them feel that there is a gap, a skills gap that they need to close. And this is high priority in order to enable them to perform in a world that has now been proven to be very volatile. So you need an adaptable workforce, you need a workforce that's able to adapt, able to, to uh, perform multiple functions. Should we find ourselves in a, in a situation where we need to either redeploy, change strategy, pivot, which a lot of organizations have had to do. So there's a skills gap that they're now is a higher priority, they're feeling the need to close, which drives this more investment in skills building and development. And what we're also seeing is a trend, 46% of the respondents saying they need to in increase uh, redeploying talent to the point I made earlier to say, in a, in a situation where we're hit with a pandemic or some sort of global disruption, we need to ensure that the people within the organization are adaptable enough to be able to assume a different role within the organization. And we need to be skilling people in order to be able to do that. So what does this mean for the types of skills that are required to enable people to be adaptable for the future? So this is what the survey found, right? So the skills that have been prioritized are, are being prioritized to the reskilling uh, have also shifted. So if you see the little, the white dot indicates what was the actual uh, percentage of respondents that responded that that was a priority skill in 2019 versus 2020 is where it's moved to, which is the solid block. So as you can see, 
the black ones are the social and emotional skills, what's traditionally been referred to as the soft skills. The light blue ones are the advanced cognitive skills, and the darker blue one is the technological or more technical skills, which in the past, most people would put up high on the list as the key skills for people being adaptable in the industry or in the age of industry 4.0. So if you can see that there's a big, the biggest moves in terms of skills that need to be prioritized over the, from 2019 to 2020 has been on the skills that are black, which is the social and emotional skills. So you can see, for example, the leadership and managing others moving for about 39 to about 51% of the respondents saying they're going to focus on that to something like interpersonal skills and empathy moving from about 20% to 40% in terms of the respondents are saying now they're going to focus on that. And similarly, we see a lesser sort of increase in most other sort of technological skills. So advanced data and analytical mathematical skills hardly moved. That's about from 34 to 35% of people saying they're going to focus on that. Advanced IT skills as well, moving from about 28 to 30%. As well. So there hasn't been a large move in terms of what people see as a focus on technological skills. The focus has been more on the softer or social skills and what is deemed here, call, called here advanced cognitive skills or thinking skills, right? So it's skills around giving people the ability to think critically and make proper decisions about the organization in order to drive the organization forward. And this is basically the fundamental <laughs> principles that we have over the years built some mind on. So it was very interesting to see the study come through that the realization is finally happening that yes, technology is there. Yes, we may need it. Yes, it has a role to play, but without upskilling or reskilling our workforce in the more social and emotional skills and the advanced cognitive skills, the thinking skills, we're not really gonna harness the full value of this technology, because we need a workforce that's adaptable, a workforce, a workforce that's able to make critical, think critically and make effective decisions in order to drive our organization forward. But with all that said, we shouldn't and we cannot underestimate the power of legacy. Right? What we mean by that is that a nice quote that sums it up is this quote that I have on the screen by John uh, Maynard Keyes is that the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping old ones. So to further emphasize that point, I'm sure many of you on this call have worked and in, in, your, in your working career, many of you probably can't recall a time you were ever asked to stop doing something. Right? I mean, if I asked you when were you ever asked to stop doing something in an organization, many of you would answer either never or not very frequently, but many of you have been asked to keep, uh, to actually add and start doing something new, right? So it's very easy for us to add new things to do, but it's very difficult for us to stop doing the things that were not actually benefiting us and actually adopting new ways in which to do new things in order to achieve better results. So this is just to emphasize the fact that legacy is quite a powerful thing and they, we shouldn't ever underestimate the inertia to change. So a lot of people have that inertia to change and that unwillingness to just change voluntarily. So there needs to be a way in which we can ensure that the change happens and not only that it happens, but then the change becomes sustainable and it actually drives behavioral change within the organization. So this is what we're talking about here, which is how do we overcome the initial inertia for change, towards change, and actually drive towards ongoing behavioral change. So at the top here, we have a table that shows um, different <coughs> uh, categories. So this is an instructional approaches. This is how much knowledge transfer is done by each of the instructional approaches. The ability to demonstrate a new behavior based on that instructional approach and the ongoing behavioral change that exists that can be seen based on that instructional approach as well. So if we look at the traditional instructional approach of presentation, similar to what I'm doing today, it's a concept and a theory, right? Some of you will probably work with 85% of the knowledge will be retained. 
but the ability to demonstrate a new behavior, meaning to take what has been taught and actually demonstrate it as a new behavior in the workplace is only 15%. And that only translates to 10% of people actually then indicating a organ of ongoing behavioral change. If we just use the normal concept and theory presentation approach. Now, if we move to the modeling approach, which is more structure, excuse me, demonstration based, where an instructor will give a theory, then demonstrate how it actually works. Right? The knowledge retention is all still 85%. The ability to demonstrate the new behavior moves up because now I've seen it, I've seen how it's actually supposed to be done. So that moves from 15% uh, to about 18%. But again, getting that into, into being an ongoing behavioral change that is exhibited on a day-to-day -day basis is still only 10% of the time that you will see that translate into an ongoing behavioral change. Then we move into the low risk practice with feedback. So you allow a person to practice the actual, uh, what you're teaching. So you, you teach it, then you allow them to practice it in a safe environment. So you create what uh, everyone calls psychological safety for that person. So you create a safe environment that they can actually practice this and give them feedback. So we see that they retain 85% of the knowledge. <laughs> they demonstrate 80% of the new behavior. So they're able to do it because they've practiced it and they have a chance to actually practice it in a safe environment. Then that translates to an increase in 5% of ongoing behavioral change. It's still not great, right? It's still not indicating that this will drive an actual organizational or behavioral change. Then we move to the approach that has led to the, the way we approach uh, skill development and training, which is the coaching post-training. So you do do the experiential training, which is actually showing with demonstration and actually getting people to do it, but this post-training coaching. So that results in 90% of knowledge retention, 90% in the ability to demonstrate the new behavior in the new environment, and 80% of, 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 of people will then show an ongoing behavioral change. So this is how you actually get to transformation, right? A lot of people speak about transformation. They develop a skills development roadmap and a program, but if you don't have this ongoing coaching as can be indicated here, it's not gonna actually be sustainable and be driven to throughout the organization as a way of living, as a way of doing work on a day-to-day -day basis. So on the bottom there, training and development is not just a presentation and content delivery. So in the age of online, yes, online has enabled us to have a broader reach. However, we need to think further than that and think very critically about the methods that we use to translate our, 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 our skills and development programs so that we ensure that we achieve this ongoing behavioral change which is what we want to get to is essentially to transform an organization and move it up that has curved. Now this brings us to SimMine, which is the actual SimMine mining simulation that we have built over many, many years. So this is based on the ultimate research that we did into automotive industry and the fact that we found that there is a actual system that any industry can use that we have found to actually better understand how to drive value out of a end-to-end -end value chain. So this simulation has been run globally across multiple industries. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, case studies are in mining, particularly. It has been run with executives, senior management, researchers, uh, business improvement practitioners, MBA students, and even lecturers. And the results have been very similar across those different groups of people, which has led us to a conclusion that there was actually a very low maturity in terms of systems thinking skills in, in the industry. So SimMine as a simulation is an end-to-end -end value chain that mimics all the key activities in a, in a typical open cost mining uh, environment. <clears throat> and it also incorporates some of the other human uh, and interpersonal elements that you generally find in organization. Right? So some of you might be interested to see how this actually works. So I'll run you through a quick case study of how this would work. So generally we'd run about 30 delegates to actually operate SimMine as an organization. 
all the way from mining, which is drilling, blasting, loading, hauling, transferring to a ROM stockpile, processing the material, product delivery and logistics, all the way to a customer. Now then what we do to create that interpersonal uh, uh, a layer or dimension to it is that this operation, not only as operators operating each one of these activities, we also have frontline managers and then or frontline supervisors, we have managers, there's a finance department that, that deals with processing orders that manages the cost on the organization. There's a safety element that we bring in as well, where we have a safety officer and an environmental officer that actually tries to take care of <clears throat> all those different aspects on the, all the she aspects on the, on the within the mine. And we have a GM with his exco and managers of, of all the different departments. And we create an actual organization, but right? we mimic an actual organization and we get delegates to actually run this organization as they would an organization on a day-to-day -day basis. And we see how they perform. So we'll generally run the first round for about 20 minutes and see how they actually perform. Now, the results that we found, and as I mentioned, across industries, across geographic locations, generally in the first round, teams achieve about 12, sometimes up to 14 orders which is about 20% of the actual installed capacity of the actual sim mine simulation. So they're well <clears throat> on the bottom side of that S-curve. And this sort of leaves a lot of people frustrated because people do a lot of work. They actually busy mining, they're busy trying to do as the best that they can, and they only achieve this result, right? To see this, it, it is kind of frustrating for some people. But what we have found is it also drives a bit of motivation for people to say, well, can I do better, right? So that's the, the question we always pose to them after the first round, can you do better? Is there any way you can improve on this performance, right? And that drives the motivation for people to say, definitely, of course, I mean, from this performance, you can definitely do better. So we give people the opportunity to go away, now that they understand the system, they run it, they run the organization, now as mimicking the real life management team, they would go out in the departments, go out and try to come up with solutions to actually turn this operation around. And what you generally find is that people do what we traditionally do in organizations, right? Similar to the uh, different approaches, the traditional approaches I mentioned earlier, there's two things that generally come through. <clears throat> it's one is we need people to work better or harder, so we find people requesting either training for people or requesting uh, people to, to move around, changing people around, or sometimes we even find cost reduction uh, uh, initiatives that remove certain people out of their jobs without understanding that that, that might be a critical role. But the most common sort of approach that we find is the approach of actually investing more capital with, into the system to try and drive the performance up. So, the matter of buying bigger trucks, buying bigger screens, getting uh, <clears throat> more more facilities, getting more truck drivers, getting more resources. So there's all these plethora of initiatives that are being thrown at, at, at the game. And generally in this round, we allow, it's a free for all. We allow most improvements to be made. The only thing we won't allow is the actual moving of the or source or the actual reserve, which is the mine. Everything else is, is fair game, right? So, they, they implement the solutions and they achieve a probably about a hundred percent improvement, which sounds like a great improvement. However, considering the fact that they're still that far down on the S curve and they spend additional capital, it really isn't that great an improvement and the organization still isn't profitable even at that improved performance. So that is where, they, that's where we create that cognitive dissonance which is what we found actually helps people shift the mindset to say, wait a minute, we need a different approach. So this helps create that cognitive dissonance for most people to say, can we take a different approach to what we've been doing traditionally in order to achieve a better outcome? And one of the most fundamental things, as I mentioned, is, is, is in terms of a different approach is understanding your system, right? It's taking a different view to say, this isn't an individual effort. This isn't a departmental effort. This isn't a siloed effort. It's more than just throwing more solutions at what we perceive to be problems 
It's understanding the entire organization, understanding the interconnectedness of the different activities, which can then allow us to focus on different short, medium, and long-term object objectives and priorities. So once we understand our entire system, how the impact of different interconnected activities, then we can understand where we need to focus in the short, medium, and longer term. So this is what, what does actually improvement look like, right? Um, for SimMind, uh, we can actually demonstrate a 600% improvement, right? So that is actually what can be achieved from what most people achieve in the first round. But the question is how to improve this performance, right? So we're not gonna give away all the answers because we'd like you to come and actually experience the SimMind simulation for yourself and actually get to get a better understanding of some of these tools and techniques and some of the key principles in order to move yourself up from the current performance up to your maximum put potential on that S curve. But what we find is by doing that, usually if people run through our programs and we implement the right sort of <clears throat> tools and techniques, we can achieve a 600% on semi. What we have seen, because we also implement this in actual real life organizations, when you're interested, we have a couple of case studies we can share with you after this uh, webinar. We do also see a 30 to 100 percent improvement in just implementing some of the basic tools and techniques that we go through in, in the SimMind simulation. So we, we have seen that these are rep replicable in an actual physical mining uh, environment. Right? So a lot of people might say, well, this is a control environment, it's a simulation. We have actually proven these results in the actual field <clears throat> in mining organizations. So what does it take to improve this performance, right? So there's skills and capability that we spoke about. And as we've seen, there's a bigger drive to, for skills and capability to enable organization to move from an organization where what we find is there's a lot of individuals in organizations. It's not really organ, or, or organized as a, as a team. So if you think of a soccer team, you can buy the best players uh, you can in the world, but if you don't have a, a, a way of ensuring that everyone knows their role, everyone knows what they're doing in the team, there's a way of facilitating communication, and they, there's, an, there's an open uh, uh, <clears throat> sort of line of communication, you can find that it's gonna be very difficult for the team to perform, even though they're very individually, they're good high performing individuals. If you don't find a way to facilitate those people together, to get their collective consciousness, get them to understand the system flow and how to maximize it, how to measure the variability and the impact of the variability and how to orchestrate the projects in terms of the right areas and the right focus areas at the right time in order to drive performance up. So that's all about skills and capabilities development. But as I mentioned with the slide that I put up that speaks to how do we then entrench this and make this now part of the organizational behavior. So you need effective leadership and management. That's where that comes in. That's where the coaching comes in. That's where the leadership and management needs to start asking different questions. They need to be supporting any efforts that are being <clears throat> implemented in terms of new skills that people are learning to help drive the organization upwards. So we always take the approach of a top-down approach. We need to start with senior executives. They need to understand it. They need to be aligned. Then we move down to the organization so that there is support for anything that's being implemented. Because you can imagine if I'm the new guy and I just got my black belt, for example, in Lean Six Sigma, nothing's really gonna change if everyone else around me is not supportive of it. And I don't have that coaching and that constant support to help me, to help me and help the rest of the organization change that into an organizational behavior. So we need that effective leadership and management. And then, if, and then at, a, at a higher level, we need an effective operational system capability framework or operating model, right? So this is how, how does all of this fit together? What does this mean for levels of work, work and management routines, day-to-day -day routines, and how people do things on a day-to-day -day basis? So we need to have a proper process and structure as to how people do things on a day-to-day -day basis, but that's a, a, a very <clears throat> a detailed uh, uh, discussion that we won't get into today, but it, it sort of supports everything that that we, we we've talked about earlier for the skills and capability and the, having the effective leadership to support and coach that. 
So what we're really talking about here is taking a what can seem to be a very overwhelming for a lot of people, a very complicated, a very complex uh, uh, situation that they find themselves in, because now they're in this organization, all these technologies, there's this pressure from senior management to perform. There's all these different interconnected activities. How do I take all that and take it and, and structure it in a way that it makes sense, right? So that's what SimMind is all about. It's about simplifying that complexity, creating processes, creating uh, uh, <clears throat> simplified ways in which to apply, practical ways in which to apply tools and techniques uh, that, that enable organizations to better make decisions in order to drive effectiveness. So that's what we're saying on the slide, with this graph on the right. But increase the simplicity in which you communicate things in which people understand the concepts, people understand the processes, and that will drive the effectiveness of any efforts that people undertake. So the simpler you make it and increase the simplicity of people understanding it and the ability to implement it, the greater the chances you have of those efforts being more effective within the organization. So we spoke about skills and capabilities, just to speak more specifically about them and the skills that we specifically cover in, in the SimMind simulation, <clears throat> if you go through some of the programs is, there's obviously facilitation and leadership, that's part of those social and emotional skills. So that's all about how do you effectively lead different individuals within an organization and get them to a collective uh, intelligence or collective sort of consensus as to how do we actually move and make decisions collectively. And that is a, a fundamental building block and it also, this skill also helps drive empathy, right? So it helps you understand people so that you can develop your interpersonal skills and understand that as a leader, you are more a facilitator than you are a dictator who tells people what it is that they need to do. Your role is to facilitate getting the best out of people, right? Someone once said, you don't hire smart people and then tell them what to do, but you hire smart people so they can come up with smart results and smart solutions to problems that you have. So you need to be able to facilitate that process to get the best out of people. So that's all about those social and, and emotional skills that people need. Then we talk about system flow, which is all about understanding the end-to-end -end value chain and understanding where your constraints are and how to focus on the constraints to effectively then solve the right problems, right? So problem identification and identifying what's the purpose of the overall system and <clears throat> where we need to be focusing. So there we deal with things like value stream mapping and how do you actually identify and manage your constraints. Then we talk about the impact of variation. Right? So I spoke about the fact that there's interconnectedness between the different activities. So if you're having a bet, if you're interconnected to me and I'm interconnected to you, so we're highly dependent on each other. If you're having a bad day, then I'm having a bad day. If I'm having a bad day, even if though you had a good day, the overall system had a bad day. So in essence, you also had a bad day. So we need to understand that and understand how can we mitigate, how do we measure that first of all and understand that, and how can you put measures in place to help us better minimize the impact of that variation on the overall system. So that involves a lot of data analysis, a lot of data gathering and setting of the right KPIs to make sure that we are actually measuring the right thing to measure the impact of that variability. Then we speak about project orchestration, which is basically speaking to about how do we then, once you've identified all of these things, how do we then match the key areas we need to be focusing on, and the projects we need to be implementing, and we, how do we integrate those into the higher strategic objectives and making sure that there's alignment on those and on the constraints, and how do we do critical project benefit analysis, right? So how do we measure which metric the project a project is going to move? So this also helps minimize this initiative overload that I spoke about earlier. So that helps people focus, it helps people understand if I am implementing a new project, where exactly is this going to be in, in, in impacting and what is going to be the extent of that impact? So we need a better way of understanding how to do that and integrating that into our long-term strategic uh, targets. So those, those are the specifics of, of some of the critical skills that we actually help highlight and, and facilitate the, the, the development of 
in, in, in individuals who actually go through the SIMINE experience. So as with many organizations, I presented to you the actual SIMINE physical. What we have done is over the past year, over COVID, we have actually developed the SIMINE digital experience as well, which has enabled us to actually then take the SIMINE experience and broaden the reach of it far quicker than we could have post COVID. So we had to reskill as well during COVID. So we had our own period of, of having to rapidly adapt and reskill some of the people in the organization and find new skills in order to enable us to be able to take the current physical simulation, try and replicate it in a digital format without losing any of the learnings um, or <clears throat> as little of the learnings as possible. Obviously, we would still prefer an experiential sort of tangible uh, uh, experience, but we have found a way to help drive a similar experience using digital platforms as we've been forced to do over the last 12 months or so. And that brings a conclusion, the actual presentation. Um, so I was trying to rush through a little bit at the end to give us a bit more time for questions. So we left with about 15 minutes. I don't know if there are any questions in the Q&A. So feel free to scan the QR code there to get, link us to your, link you to our website. You can also contact us um, at info at simine.co. And there's also our office number here in Johannesburg. And if you need our personal details, mine's or Harry's, I'm sure you can reach out to Masin, the people at SMI, and they'll be more than willing to share those <laughs> with you with our permission. So we give them the permission to do so. That's what I'm saying. Um, so thank you very much for, for taking the time to, to, to let me run through this presentation for you, uh, with you. And yeah, I'll open the floor to any questions if there, if there are any, Masin. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Anthony. And uh, additional thanks for, because I know that it's very late in the evening for you. So uh, much appreciated that you made the time to do this at this time for us. We do have one question. I'm, I'm hoping that maybe uh, we might get a few more as we go, but um, uh, you touched on the fact that there might be 600% improvement that you do find in, uh, in the operation that, of the semi. The question is, without giving away your deepest trade secrets, of course, can you just shed a tiny bit more light on how you get a 600% improvement? Sure. Um, Harry, I saw you want... And, and maybe, sorry, as a follow-up, what, what form does a subsequent coaching take? Harry, I saw you wanted to answer that one. You want to take that one? Are you, you're muted, Harry. Harry, you're on mute. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so so Anthony covered a lot of it, really, in, uh, in talking through, you know, the, some of the early concepts. And the first one is around correctly identifying where the constraint in the systems or system is. Or, and there may be more than one constraint. So it's all about the discipline around how to identify that. And then uh, the other one is the uh, discipline or robustness around um, deploying assets to that area, you know, focusing on that area. And, uh, you know, people we find um, know what and can come up with really effective solutions to sorting that out. So they're the two principal things which not very common in a very busy environment in uh, in industry and, and you know in the working life of people um, the coaching the it, it forms many different uh, approaches quite often we're then engaged in doing further work in an organization to help uh, restructure the way that some of that work is done and some of that focus occurs and it's really about embedding those workflows in the in the organization and then training people with the correct tools to be able to deliver on those. But yeah, that's probably as far as I can go, unless Anthony, you want to add anything else? No, I mean, uh, that covers it, Harry. And and, and we, we also covered it as the, the actual organizational uh, structure needs to change as well to support the ongoing coaching and, and making sure the leadership and the management team understand that their role needs to change if they if they if they want to make sure that this becomes a sustainable solution. Okay, and we've got another yeah, look I think sorry, sorry no, I think in addition, we'll carry this last question in a minute too. In addition, I think uh, you know when Anthony talked earlier about leadership, it's it's around that discipline of focusing on the things that need to be focused on the toolkit that helps them identify that. 
and being unrelenting in that area. And uh, that's how we get a lot of the results we uh, work with in our client uh, in our client businesses is that focus, you know, that sort of redirection and focus. And what that requires is a uh, is uh, leadership to ch start changing the questions that they're asking. So that's the other big important piece. Okay, uh, back to you, Marcin. Thanks, Harry. We have a, another question from uh, Stephen Ajango. Uh, he says, uh, how does one avoid being caught up in the hype of the 4IR? <laughs> yeah, well, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you my... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, could go ahead. Uh, well, I'll give you my very quick one and then Anthony can pick it up. So it's really about, you know, getting the value out of the, of the install capacity that you have. That's the number one thing. Find out where the problem and constraints are, and then you know the solutions for those constraints, the problem definition and identification of the constraint, then allows you to start to figure out what type of solutions you need to apply to that constraint. And at the end of the day, if it's a technology or a software solution, then you know focus on that. But the solution isn't just one to plug technology in. It's also to help in, inculcate that with the workflows within the organisation. Often the two are divorced. Uh, Anthony, over to you. Yeah, I mean, you, I think you covered it well, Harry. And look, there always will be that temptation to, to, to jump to the newest, shiniest object. And we find it in the work that we do. We have a, a lot of these discussions, right? Um, or we, we, we come in post the implementation of all these new fancy systems and, and now they're not working, right? And people are blaming the systems, but uh, the new technologies, but nobody took the time and consideration to understand how this actually helps solve actual problems. So as I mentioned before, and Harry touched on it, it's, it's, it's solutions chasing after problems rather than identifying what the problems are and then applying the right solutions to those problems. So it's about having the discipline again to, to first be rigorous in your identification of the problem and being clear on what that is. And then based on that, finding the right solutions that will help uh, solve those problems. Fantastic. Well, I've actually got a question myself, having sat through and gone through uh, some of your training in the past, um, the question was asked before the 600% and I've, I've it's seen it firsthand, but one thing I found through through that um, activity was finding uh, the letting people believe that it's possible and getting them out of the space that their I guess their discipline or their speciality is. The question I have is, uh, in your experience, how do you find that space to get people out of their area and really uh, look at the overall value chain? Um, and make them even believe that it's possible to double or triple the, the performance or more. Okay, um, again, I'll, I'll leave with this one and then Anthony, you can fill in any of the gaps I might leave. So one of the, one of the critical things Anthony mentioned earlier in the four sort of responses we get from, you know, often employees is, you know, they uh, often don't know what a good day's work, you know, is and all that sort of stuff. So the first one was really critical. The I don't know what a good day for me looks like means that, you know, there are general high level uh, targets that an organisation puts out, but I don't connect to that target. I don't know what, you know, a good day to delivering to that target looks like for me. So that's one critical thing. But, but on the other hand, it's also important to be able to measure the same thing through the value chain, the same, uh, you know, metric. And what, what we don't do very well in organisations is do that piece as well for the analysis. Because if you measure the, every process step in a value chain using the same metric, what you then can identify generally is, you know, how and what, uh, where are the constraints. And once you've identified that, you can then show where good performance is occurring in an organisation, telling people, you know, you guys are good, keep, keep that work up. At the same time, you're identifying where the constraints are and what we can do to try and help alleviate some of those constraints. And it's really how you bring those people together to solve that problem, um, you know, and identify 
uh, the con within the identified constraint, which is really critical. And, you know, uh, it's how you manage that sort of energy of wanting to participate in identifying solutions to what you've identified as a problem, where the magic occurs, I think. And, uh, and then there's greater, I guess, uh, intention from people and, and uh, effort to be able to deliver that outcome because they're part of the solution design. And that's really how, uh, you know, the whole process fits in and uh, how we encourage people to get together and uh, you know, come up with the solutions. And hence, you know, one of our first uh, pillars around the skills and capabilities, all of those, uh, what we call them, community and emotional skills, so facilitation and leadership, and that's uh, embodied in all of that uh, training that we do. Anthony? Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I can add there is, and if you touched on it a bit, Harry, is um, what I learned from you, actually, is the, the concept of congruence, right? And I mentioned it when I said, in the first round, people are frustrated that they work so hard, but they didn't achieve a good result. But because they're part of it, and, and, and they get so um, involved and emotionally attached to wanting to do uh, better. And I think it's something that, we highlight to a lot of senior executives that come through that people that actually work on organizations in, 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 in the in sort of on the shop floor actually on a day-to-day -day basis get emotionally attached to the work and want to do well in the work. They just need the proper support and, and some of the someone to address those four issues that we highlighted. So you create that congruence in, in that people get emotionally involved and they actually want to do better. And that also helps make it easier for them to believe that it is possible and, and want to try and, and do better. Great. Maybe if I could add just one little, uh, we've got a few more minutes, one little, uh, I guess, uh, energy that we, we base all of our work on. And um, there was a little, some of you may have seen, it was an internet uh, video where there's a uh, train station in, somewhere in Sweden where they've got a <laughs> wide, uh, staircase leading up from uh, or leading down from the street level and then they've got this little escalator to the side and the escalator is probably a meter wide 1.2 meters wide the staircase is probably about four meters wide and they've got a, a camera and train on it and what you see is you know 99 percent of people using the escalator going to and from you know commuting and very few people using the stairs so what they did was they closed the station overnight and they taped up the stairs looking like piano keys and uh, put transducers under these keys and then filmed that. And, and the transducers actually made piano key sounds, right? The next day, the exact opposite was the case. Most people were using the staircase and few people using the escalator. So what's that got to do with what you know we've been talking about? And we believe that, and we've proven it many times, that the more you involve people and the more you create a space where people feel comfortable to experiment and, and, and develop, the greater the result. And you know what we've done at work is quite often in the workplace is quite often limit that. And if you've got the right questions to ask, engaging people can be as much fun as what these guys did in that um, in that subway station, which is really about creating that excitement uh, and interest, and as Anthony put it, congruence, you know, collaboration effort. And uh, in de developing semi as as the uh, sort of primary way of uh, transferring knowledge and experience and learning, what we found is that you know people love that space and they learn a lot more. They're much more effective in the outcome. So. Uh, yeah, it sort of drives our uh, our motivation and uh, focus. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Well, with that, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much for everyone for attending. Uh, thank you uh, for Anthony and Harry for your time and particularly the uh, challenging uh, time of day for you. Uh, for details for next uh, month's webinar, please keep an eye on the SMI website. And if you'd like to learn more about Simine, uh, the CIMON team in collaboration with the Sustainable Minerals Institute will actually be running a short course on the 21st and 22nd of June. Uh, you can find details of how to register on that at the professional development section of the Sustainable Minerals Institute site website. 
Thank you again for your company. Have a great day. And thanks again to the uh, Simon team. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, Masi. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye.